And when you start selling with that energy of really genuinely wanting to improve their lives, every technique and tactic that you bring to the playbook is actually showing empathy. Welcome to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'm your host, Maritza Barone. In this show, I will introduce you to ideas, concepts, and mindsets that will open your mind to a new world of well-being and personal life growth. Through eye-opening interviews, we elevate people in the world doing amazing things for humanity and share insights that will shift you to become the happiest, healthiest, kindest, and most compassionate version of you. Hi, everyone, and happy 2020. I cannot believe we're saying 2020. It sounds so futuristic. But I always feel so inspired at the start of a new year to really go after what's important to me and become an even better version of myself than I was the year before. So to build on that, I've joined forces this year with the team behind Conscious Collaborations to bring you a live panel event this February called On Purpose, where we will explore the mind-body connection and how we can use this to unleash our untapped potential. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast from the beginning, you will have heard all three panelists on the show, three complete life changers with deep knowledge on living life consciously. We've got Jennifer McCormack, a kinesiologist and personal development coach, Dr. Jennifer Barham Floriani, an award-winning chiropractor and author of Well-Adjusted Babies, which I'm sure you've heard of because she's sold over half a million copies, and Shelley McKenzie, a leading nutritionist and naturopath from Freedom Wellness. So why do you need to come along? Well, start the year off with the right techniques and mindset that is going to get you to thrive personally and professionally. We'll also be recording the podcast live from the event so you can see it all in action. I'll put a link in the show notes that will direct you to the ticket page. So if you live in Melbourne, Australia, make sure you reserve your seat and take the first step to an epic year ahead. Hope to see you there. Now on this episode today, we're kicking it off with Jason Campbell, one of the amazing sales and marketing leaders at Mind Valley which, if you haven't heard, is the School of Human Transformation and is led by Vishen Lakiani. And I've been raving about them all throughout these podcast episodes that I've been sharing over the last 12 months. It's a platform that explores leading edge ideas in personal transformation and is an exceptional tool for life growth. Jason is also the host of one of Mind Valley's podcasts called Superhumans at Work and is passionate about changing the mindset around sales and marketing to a perspective where we all sell with love. We'll learn how sales can come from a place of love rather than fear and change the idea of what sales means to you because many of us have adopted a negative view of selling over time. We will also hear how to make an impact on your sales results and also walk away feeling proud of the transactions you have made because you know you have left people better off by buying what you're selling. We're all salespeople in some way. Even the way we interact with one another is a form of selling, whether we're selling an idea, a concept, a service, a product, your time and more. Now, Jason is going to share his five key tips for selling with love. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Hi, Marissa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Now, selling with love. Now, a lot of us have a very negative mindset when it comes to selling. You're shifting this paradigm, aren't you? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm in the process of writing a book and the first chapter opens up with the fact that, you know, why is it that we hate sales? And it's so ingrained in our thoughts that when we think sales, there's like a yucky feeling that comes up. And I can't hold myself back from thinking of a used car salesman or some (laughs) slimy person on wall street that's just taking advantage of me these polarizing events or or caricatures that we see in our society about sales just has really reinforced a sense of disgust i mean if you've seen a movie like the wolf of wall street or boiler room it's always about these people with a snack or a skill for sales just happen to be these people that take advantage of people and then you're like you know what i don't want to be like that. And once you have this idea that sales is bad, the concept of embracing it as a powerful tool that could actually be used as an expression of love becomes not even in a realm of possibilities. And so as I'm going through this, I'm hoping to really change that because I think there's a case for not only liking sales, but there's a strong case for absolutely loving it. 
for us listening out here and maybe in a sales environment, because a lot of us are in one way, shape or form, what are the biggest signs that we are in a sales environment that doesn't align with us? Yeah, there, there's a few things that can happen where you have a negative association with the sales. How do you start shifting your own relationship with sales and making kind of a case to like it? Because I think going as far as saying you should love sale is a little bit of a stretch given that most people are probably starting from square one here. There's so many events that happen in our lives that are sales. And most people have this caricature image of a salesperson. And because there's so much negative associations with it, you don't want to become one yourself. Thus, you will resist the process. Now, what if we start painting the picture of identifying other people that are salespeople? And you can think of an idea where somebody is looking to get a job. You go through a job interview. Would you say that the person that is saying, these are my skills, this is why I deserve the job, is a salesperson? Mm, absolutely. You're selling okay. yourself. You're selling yourself. Okay, so that's an example of sales. Now, what if there's a promotion that opened up at work? What would be the number one thing you could do to promote yourself to get that job? Again, sell yourself. <laughs> All right. Now, for those who are single within your audience, what are the best ways that you can find a partner? Now, for people that are in a relationship, what do you have to do every single day to ensure that you keep a spark alive and that you keep the spouse partner in your life? And the matter of fact is that we are all salespeople. And here's one thing that kind of opens people's perspective on sales is one of the most common known sales closing techniques to pitch that everyone has heard and has never recognized it as a proper closing mechanism is, will you marry me? Aha. Uh -huh. There's a sales pitch that happened right there. And it doesn't have to do with how you say it. And this is where people get caught up in sales is they're like, okay, I need to optimize exactly the language I use to close, convert exactly. No, 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 no. Good salesmanship is a set of behaviors that have predated every language that you've used at the moment of closing that would allow the person to want to do a transaction with you. And when you say, will you marry me? There's a lot of other things that are put in place so that the person comes from a place of love and not a place of fear. So now we're starting to say, okay, everybody is a bit of a salesperson. We all have to do it in our lives. Now, what about cases of great salespeople? I mean, have you ever seen the rocket launch of SpaceX on TV? Well, here's what I really love about the fact that I ended up going to see one yesterday. And when you look at how SpaceX launches a rocket, they mounted cameras on those rockets. They have a live stream with a host that explains what's going on. And in my head, there's a part of me that goes, wow, isn't that dead weight? Like it costs a lot of money to bring weight up into space. Why would they put in the effort of setting up a camera on the rockets? Why are they investing money on actually getting people to do the hosting and do all of these activities that add cost to launching a product. And it's because when you add a layer of sales, now you can actually magnify the impact of whatever it is that you're doing as a company, as a product, because more people will have their eyeballs on what you're doing, will understand the impact of what you're doing, and now you start getting the right people aligning with you. So stock price for SpaceX, higher. People all excited about SpaceX. Anybody who wants to launch cargo knows about SpaceX. Do you know what ULA is? It's a collaboration between Boeing and Lockheed Martin that also launches rocket, yet most people don't even know about it. And so where are the best engineers going to go work? You can see how the sales allows the magnification of the impact because there's so many stakeholders that are impacted when you decide to put effort into the process of sales. And the whole point here is the fact that Elon Musk is an amazing salesperson. And now you get to see some people that are role models of good sales that you could say, hey, maybe it's not just the used car salesman when I think of a salesman, but if I'm inspired to be someone who's like Elon Musk, who's like Steve Jobs, or any great entrepreneur of our time has had to embrace an element of salesmanship to rally all of the stakeholders that are involved in every transaction that happens. Mm, absolutely. It's, you look at that and you want to be a part of it without them actually having to physically or do the traditional me methods of selling. You want to be there. They've, they've Ex lured you in. Exactly. And so now you've opened up the possibility that, hey, maybe I can like sales. Maybe there are role models and maybe I can do this. But there's a lot of resistance that still happens because sale hasn't been given a proper definition. 
And there's a way that I define it that really gets people to think differently, especially if your audience and the people listening here are more in the spiritual space. They're going to love that I'm going to use words like emotion and energy in the definition of sales. Are you ready? Selling is an energy exchange between two conscious beings. That's it. Now, imagine when you have the awareness that what you are giving is so much more than what you're asking in return, then selling becomes the greatest expression of love and care. Mm. Yes, you're providing value to the, to the person buying from you, no matter what it is. It's a product, it's a service, it's, it's a tool, it's, it's a course. You're providing value to them. So if we shift our perspective we don't feel as though there's that tackiness or that ickiness of selling because we're adding value to their lives. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And you're realizing that, okay, I'm saying this is the cost, which money is a form of energy. This is the product and service that you're getting. And then you're trying to get as close as possible to understanding the client so that you get an idea of what the real value is for them. And the marketing, the sales and everything that you do is simply to make the real value and the perceived value, which is all that's generated with all your sales and marketing, to be closer to the same so that the person can see what it's worth because you understand how it can deeply improve their lives. And when you start selling with that energy of really genuinely wanting to improve their lives, every technique and tactic that you bring to the playbook is actually showing empathy. Mm, it's true. I think there's a lot of unlearning we need to do when it comes to sales. And I want to go back to where you think that these negative ideas around selling come from initially in our lives. I know that Vision uh, from Mind Valley talks about rules, which are bullshit rules all the time that we've learned in our, in our younger years or have been or have inherited over time. But is it something that you think we need to unlearn and relearn in a new way? There's an interesting story that I share that affects some people that could have had an experience with this here. We're talking about when you're going to early childhood, which a lot of these beliefs are formed, there is usually a case where you find yourself wanting things as an innocent child. And children are natural salespeople. Like if you are of a generation that wanted these gaming consoles when you were growing up, and you basically would go to your parents and say, hey, can I please get the new Nintendo? Please, 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 I want it. And then you would see enthusiasm. You would see persistence. You would see trying different angles, massive communication, be heard. All of the techniques would naturally come to you as a child. But there usually comes a point where you keep asking and pounding and hounding your parents with the request that they say, hey, no means no, stop asking. Okay, so here you've just, made the, you've just made the equation be that when I persist too much, when I ask too much, mom and dad get pissed off and they don't love me and I don't feel safe and I'm in fear, the sales is bad. Are there other examples of when we could have learnt sort of negative mindsets around selling, maybe not from our childhood? I think there's a case that you more than likely have been through a sales scenario where you've seen somebody actually take advantage of you. If you had your first car purchase, you've had something that you bought that you realize you overpaid for and you're just frustrated because it felt like the right decision at the time. And this sense of disappointment in the middle of that transaction really holds you back going, my God, all these salespeople are bad because you will remember the bad instances that happen. Mm -hmm. But there's a case of understanding that needs to happen. And if you're a big uh, fan of uh, spiritual concepts from, for example, Neil Donald Walsh, Very he much speaks so. about, there you go. So he, he speaks a lot about, you know, uh, understanding replaces forgiveness. And so if you've had a bad interaction with a salesperson, maybe it was an apathetic salesperson, uh, and you're just, you, you have to understand that that person might not be at a place of abundance that you are. And that's not just on a financial level, but it could be on a mindset level as well. And so you have to step into it with compassion and understanding. And I would encourage anybody who's been in those scenarios where they got taken advantage to just take it for the learnings that you can get from it. You have to understand that that person might not be at the place you are and you have to let it go because it won't change their lives, but it's holding your life back. Mm. Absolutely. So I know you're a very spiritual person from the work that I've seen about you and what I've read and how you're talking now. But what do you think happens to us spiritually when we sell services or products that we don't believe in and we don't mm -hmm. think is worth buying? I mean, if we're ultimately in our minds believing that we're ripping people off just for our own financial gain, do you think that has a spiritual effect on us? I mean, 
the caricature that I'll paint is if you think of anybody that's doing sales from a place of fear, and I'm going to go and, and talk a bit about power versus force. And this is um, an amazing book where they put out kind of the level of consciousness and energy levels and their vibrational factor. Anybody who's doing a sale that's below the fear level, and you're talking about, uh, um, and you're talking about shame, guilt, fear, apathy, you know, when I said there was an energy exchange, the fact is that one of the variables that most people don't understand is emotion. Mm. Emotion is in every transaction. And so if you are selling not from a place of love, let's say you are selling a product that you know you are per the perceived value is, is made to be so much more than the real value the person's going to get, there's going to be something that equalizes that equation. And that is going to be the emotion of guilt, fear, shame, and everything negative. And it's not uncommon that you'll see people in sales field that have a tendency to want to numb their feelings through substance abuse and bad patterns and, um, and depression cases. There's something heavy that happens. Even if it doesn't feel transparent in the immediate transaction, there are some long-term effects. I mean, I can think of all the times I've done those sales that I regret, and I have done sales that I regret. And I was always left with this heaviness, this need to numb, and it just did not bring joy. And when that happens, there are signs that are telling you that something needs to change. And there are some pretty concrete things you can change so you're not hopeless. And we can prescribe people some things they can do to really change that energy into something that goes to love and above. Well, I'd love to hear them. Tell us these, these tools that you've come up with that, um, that will really help us through the sales process of life. All right. Well, see, you want to shift everything to a place of love. And so there's actually five loves you need to walk through here. And I'm going to touch on each of these and give you a practical thing that you can do in each of these steps so that people that find themselves selling a product, they're like, I don't know if this is really giving it from a place of love and a lot of those fears come up. This is actually going to make you switch to a place of abundance and it's really going to help lift the tide for everyone. Because one thing before I get into these tools I really want to talk about is, you know, there's some people that are just not at a level that they can apply these ideas of sales at a conscious level. You know, you think of someone that's just trying to feed their family uh, and they're just doing the best they can at the level of abundance they currently are. They will have more difficulties selling from love. But when more people step into their purpose and start selling from love, you'll see that it starts lifting the tide for everyone on the planet. And this raises the energy on the planet as a whole. And so you actually start becoming a critical person that plays a role in helping everyone live in their best way. Mm. And so with that disclaimer, are you ready? I'm so ready. Yes, Jason, hit me with it. <laughs> All right, Maritza. So for everybody listening, the first thing you want to do is you want to shift every aspect of your sales process from a place of love. And let's start with the most important love here in the process, which is love the impact. Love the impact. This can be substituted with the word purpose. This can be substituted with the word problem. But really what you want to make sure is whatever it is that you're doing, and this has to go beyond just the job that you have, but get some awareness of what impact you want to leave mm -hmm. on the planet while you're here. And if that relates in any way to your job, there might be a clue that you're in the right place right now. Because if you genuinely love the impact of what you do on this planet, I believe that is a correlation to the exact purpose as to why we're here. We're here to make the world a better place than when we first arrived. And so there's a certain impact that you will be drawn to wanting to make a difference. And again, looking at your past, it's very interesting and, and not accidental the fact that I am looking at my own impact and I know that I want to make good companies sell and market themselves so well that douchebag marketers and salespeople have no place in the marketplace. To me, this is an impact that I want to make. And it doesn't need to be this grandiose, uh, you know, make humanity an interplanetary species level of impact. Maybe it's just helping your community. Maybe it's just helping a family member. But I'll tell you something really interesting that I've noticed is the bigger the impact that you decide that you put your, your stake in the ground that you want to make, there seems to be a correlation with the abundance that comes into your life. Mm. And so getting clear on that impact becomes super important. I actually had someone on the show recently, uh, Liz Volpe, who, who said to actually choose your impact first and then 
build your business around the impact that you want to make on the world. And, you know, she said the tools that you've got are always going to be there. Your skills are there, but you need to choose the impact first if you really want to make a difference. And I loved that. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up and she brought that up too, because I've made the mistake before of not choosing impact. And yep. what happens is you get attached to the product, but what if your product is not what serves the impact the most, you need to be ready to walk away. Mm. And so the impact comes first. Love it. Now, once you've gotten clear on your impact and a tool you can use here is really, you know, journal out what are the things you want to leave as a mark? Like if you were at your grave, what are people going to remember you for? Or if you were at the top of a mountain and you could scream one thing and the entire earth would hear you, what would you say? Mm. These kinds of exercises really start giving you hints towards what do you care about, what values you have, and will get you closer to identifying what impact you want to make. I love that. What legacy you want to leave behind. Mm. So, You've staked your claim, you've put your flag, you've understood what is it that you want to stand for as making an impact. The next thing that you want to do is love your client. This is the second of the five loves. And it's interesting because love your clients. Some people are like, yeah, you know what? I don't love my clients. It's like, (laughs) well, (laughs) there's a love to be had to the client that you serve. And this is really important because if you understand the impact that you have on the people that you sell to, you really want to make sure that you are doing the best you can to sell as many people as possible. Because once you get clear on the client and the impact in their life, then you will see all the other loves are going to get in place. And so what's the best way to express love to a client? It's to understand and learn about the client. Yeah. And so if you're going to be loving the client, people want to be understood. This is where you want to do market research. This is where you want to do interviews with the potential clients you want to have. This is where you have conversations. So you get closer and closer to what are the true needs that these people have. And you start building these cases for an avatar. You want to understand that every time you're going to market, there's people on the other side that you're going to be impacting. And I want to give a quick trick here, Maritza, that goes beyond the person you sell to that also correlates with abundance here. Most people think that the client is only the person they sell to. But I would give an exercise for the people to not only understand the benefits of the client you're transacting to, but understand the greater benefit, especially if you're in a business to business sales setting. If you're selling to a client that's doing good in the world, the fact that they buy your product and they become more efficient, or you save them money, or you increase their impact, or you coach their leaders and they become more efficient. They start treating their employees better, which improves the lives of the employees, which improves the life of the company, which makes the company grow, which makes more people have sustainable jobs, which fuels local economies, which means family get to have more abundance. They can go on more trips. You can really go deep into looking at the ripple effect of every single sale you make so that when you come to a sales interaction with someone, it's not just about, hey, I'm going to sell you this so you get a better interest rate on your mortgage. You can come to that person and say, I truly believe that when I get people to save more money, they take more responsibility, have more freedom, and bring more abundance to the entire world, which is why I'm super excited to show you how you can save money on this mortgage, and I'll show you exactly how to do it, is a very different conversation. And it's not just a sales tactic. You actually believe it, right? It needs to be something that as a salesperson, you truly believe that in your heart. It's not just a little sentence or a tagline that you've got up your sleeve just to get the sale over the line. You truly believe in what you're selling and the impact, the positive impact that it will have on your customer. I love Mm -hmm. that. I love that Mm -hmm. a lot. And and you've um, gotten to know the customer too. And now that you know the customer, you can be more confident with selling them for a certain price because you'll have an understanding of the true value that this delivers into their lives. I think uh, you, you're very lucky in a way because you're working at Mind Valley, which is obviously selling some of the most amazing life growth tools. And I've bought many of them myself and grown so much from the products that Mind Valley is selling personally. So you are selling definitely a product that you truly believe in and that makes a big point of difference, doesn't it? 
It does. I mean, I remember going to an event we do called A Fest, and there's this lady from Australia. Her name was Leah. At a closing party, we're all wearing our costumes, and she just does eye contact with me, and I don't know who it is, but I have this woman just bolting towards me with intensity, and I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? And she comes to me with her Australian accent. She's like, hi. You're Jason Campbell. And of course, I can't do an Australian accent. So I was like, is that is not an Australian accent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I can sell, but accents is not my thing. Uh, so she's like, you're Jason Campbell. I'm like, yes, I am. Is everything okay? She's like, you called me so many times and you text messaged me so many times. And I was so annoyed every time. But I've been here and it's been the five most amazing days of my life. And I just want to say thank you. Yeah. That's what gets me excited to sell. Exactly. But then I can look at other examples where I actually used to sell swimming pools. And I can tell you with that love for the client, the notion that when people bought a pool, they would get to have refreshment. Their entire family would have an activity they can do together. Their entire kids start playing and staying at home and doing exercises and being healthier. My God, I loved selling swimming pools. It was a great thing. <sighs> And so you will want to look at how this product really helps the client and get excited about the impact that it does in their lives, because then you will come up with enthusiasm and you'll see that when you go into these next steps, you will be relentless at pursuing these to make this the best product possible. I love it. So we've got love the impact, love your client. And it's almost what you just said now, loving what you're selling. Is love your product. Love your you product. got it. Excellent. You got to love your product. Now I want to get this really actionable for people as we're already going on good time here. Love your product. There's, it's really easy to fix because some people say fake it till you make it, but I want to switch it to another paradigm because again, if you fake it till you make it, there'll be some fear, anxiety, imposter syndrome that'll come up. Here's a better tagline. Fix the product. <laughs> Okay. Now this sounds obvious, but here's a practical way you can do this. And I love giving this exercise for people that hesitate, especially when it comes to the price point of their product. And it's so interesting because at a fest, I'll use this example. Again, it was a festival that used to sell for like $2,000 and I joined my Valley and I'm like, everyone, we need to make this $5,000. And everyone's like, what? You're crazy. That's so expensive. And I'm like, you guys are so selfish. Everyone's like, excuse me, you're the one who's trying to raise the price on everyone else. I'm like, yeah, but you're never going to buy that ticket. Now you're bringing down the price, which means you have less budget, which means you can't deliver the ultimate experience that these people are looking for. The sale isn't about you. It's about the person you're selling to. And they're in a place of abundance that want to have the greatest experience of their lives. And if you had a bigger budget, would you be able to enhance the experience? They're like, yes. I'm like, then raise the price. <laughs> So I love your perspective. <laughs> so here's the exercise for everybody listening. Imagine whatever product you have that you have resistance at selling at the current price point. I'm going to borrow a line from uh, Mr. Grant Cardone. I don't want to take the credit here, but 10x that price. Mm. Add another zero. It's just a zero. And then this makes it so that it's 10 times more than ever. And you will start seeing it differently because now you can ask yourself, if it was truly 10 times more expensive, what would I have to do to make it valuable for somebody to buy it at this price point? So imagine this event, this festival was not $5,000, but was $50,000. Like who would buy a $50,000 ticket to go to a five day event? Well, once you step into that 10 X mindset, you're not coming from a place of fear where you're like, uh, maybe I should cut down my price. Maybe I should discount myself. No, 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 no you're looking at radically transforming what the offer is. So here I'd be like, wow, okay, if it was $50,000, maybe I'd have chartered private flights that get people to a paradise island and their whole hotel would be included. And maybe there'd be champagne waiting in everybody's room. And then there would be this amazing yacht experience and there would be a charity fundraiser. Maybe half of the proceeds go to a charity that we all pick together. And now we bring the best speakers in the world because I have 10 times more budget. And so you see, when you want to go and change the product, you want to do it from a place of love and not fear. And when you think of the price being 10 times more, you get into a creative space that starts innovating on what could you do to make it worth that price. The outcome is a few folds and I'll give you the primary ones. 
Number one is you might come up with some ideas and features that you could include at the current price point that would make you so much more confident about selling that product as is because new elements you've identified drive massively more value to the buyer. Second, you're more than likely going to increase the price of your offer and sell it still more aggressively because you've understood a feature that people really want. And once you've integrated it with the cost and, and margins you need to have, you can now make your baseline offer more expensive. And a third offshoot could be that you might end up selling that product at 10 times more and see that there are some people that are looking to buy it and a market for that product. And so you've really stepped into a place of love with the product because when you love the product, you love the impact and you love the client, you will do what it takes to be able to sell it at all costs because you know you are dealing with an instrument of mass transformation in a business's or an individual's life. Mm. People can definitely smell when they're being sold to, can't they? But if it comes from a, a, a genuine standpoint of value, it's a whole different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so for closing this off, there's a final thing that happens. Now that you know your product's good, you know the impact's good, you know the client and how it truly delivers value in their lives, your fourth love is love the process. Hmm. Once you've dealt with those first three elements, now you start reading the sales books and all of them and you are doing the marketing, you're doing that webinar, you're launching that podcast, you're doing the social media, you're doing the traffic and conversion if you're into the digital space and you're doing those calls, you're picking up the phone, you're leaving a voicemail, you're sending an email, you're connecting on LinkedIn, you're doing whatever it takes because you realize that every single extra effort you do to convert a single one more person is someone's lives that is greatly transformed. And so now when you apply any sales process that it's not a tool of manipulation, you're being empathetic and understanding the language that is necessary to be learned to speak to the emotions and the subconscious that allows people to convert into a purchase that you genuinely know will help serve the people. I like that because loving the selling process can be, can be daunting for a lot of people, but if you, you adapt to it in a way of love, in a mindset of love, I'm going to enjoy this process. It's going to be invigorating. I'm giving them product of value. It's, it's shifting your mindset. And it's mm -hmm. making things easier. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. There's a book called Influence, which a lot of people in sales are aware of. And one of the triggers of influence is scarcity. When you're about to take something away from somebody, they're more likely to purchase. And so I love sending an email telling people, hey, 24 hours left to purchase or the price doubles. And does the price really double? <laughs> Sometime it doesn't. Could I keep it the same price? I could, but that would be me being selfish because I know that if I get people to take action in the next 24 hours, more people will make that transaction, more lives get to be changed. And then you can just put in place the right kinds of guarantees, refund policies, whatever it takes to take away the risk when you push people to make that action that lowers the risks for them and really still lets you come from a place of love. So yes, push people to make that purchase. Yes, and give them a generous refund policy. Yes, serve all their needs when they buy and make sure that whole experience is done as smooth as possible so that you can continue to maximize your impact. I've been recently looking at some sales statistics for 2019. And in some of the research that I've been reading, it says more than 40% of salespeople say that prospecting, finding those initial clients is the hardest part of the sale. Would you agree with that? I mean, I come from a place that has awareness and knowledge of direct response marketing. And so it's, it, it, it is not the case. It's not something I've been aware of, but I feel that if you're in a sales role where you haven't been made aware of these new ideas around social media marketing, uh, you know, conversion mechanisms like webinars, reverse prospecting, inbound sales leads, I think that's probably a limited awareness of what tools are out there. And if you look at anything being taught from, you know, you have LinkedIn, which has become a massive pool of prospects that exist. There's so many things that you can do and you want to find a way to focus. I'm a big believer in a company called HubSpot. I have no financial affiliation aside from being a client of them, but they teach a ton of things when it comes to doing a new way of prospecting and a new way of selling that I think can help a lot of people that feel stuck there about what exists in the new digital landscape for all these activities that have to do with prospecting. Mm, that's a good tip. I think what you mentioned with the process earlier is almost getting people to come to you through 
through the work that you're doing, the marketing you're doing, the, the social media you're doing, you're calling people to come to you through your messaging. And that's a really enjoyable process rather than a cold calling situation where you're, you're searching for people who may not be interested in what you've got to offer. Yeah. And you're just trying to like, here's where you love the process because not only is it about making it so much more converting for the client, but you also want to, you want to respect your own time. Mm -hmm. You want to be as efficient as possible. You want to scale as much as possible because you know, if you do truly love the impact, you need to make that impact happen at scale. And so you're going to look at automation. You're going to look at marketing, advertising, paid ads, all of those techniques, you start being open to using all of them. I mean, I've had some companies say, we're not going to use Google or Facebook advertising. Those, nobody likes clicking on ads. I'm like, yeah, well, you being selfish about the way that you don't <laughs> want to advertise is letting more people suffer because they're not getting the solution that's making an impact in their lives. And what a selfish thing to do. If you truly love the client, you will get in front of them and you will make sure they become aware of how you can make their lives better. I love that. Oh, that's, that's gold. I love how you stick to your perspective so firmly because you truly believe it. So th you've given us those four tools now. What's the fifth and last tool that you, you really focus on here? Maritza, are you feeling any indication of what is the most and final importance of love when it comes to a sales process? I feel as though it may, may have been something we touched on earlier and that's maybe loving ourselves. Bingo. Mm -hmm. And so self-love this whole idea of bringing abundance to yourself is not easy and i'm gonna admit is not something that you're ever going to reach a destination i think it's a continuous journey of self-awareness self-mastery self-discovery and i'm on this journey as well I, I i notice i have my own blocks when it comes to selling especially selling myself and this self-love is something you'll continuously work on you'll continuously discover and when you start realizing that you are deserving of abundance you'll start feeling very comfortable of what is the price for your time involved in the sales process what is this price for your time in this business there's so many people that are so in love with the impact they're in love with the people they're serving they're in love with the product they do everything in the process but they forget to pay themselves first and so working on that self-love, well, I have to say and make a plug, we do have Mind Valley, and that yeah. helps a lot. And I'm in the early chapters of writing this book, and the aspect of self-love is going to be one of the most important ones that I am still on the journey of making sure people can have concrete tools on how to navigate this. Because so many times, and even myself, I see myself refusing abundance because I still have some things to see where do I actually measure myself on how much abundance do I deserve? And there's a lot of work to be done here. And that's why I'm on the journey myself. And I know that every time I've chosen love myself, I've seen financial compensation come my way. I've seen impact come my way. And I've seen again, the tide was risen for everyone around me. There's an acceptance of the abundance that come your way. And when you start accepting that, you'll see that you'll be more comfortable, you'll be able to impact more lives, you'll be able to drive the impact, you'll be able to drive the mission, and everyone else that does business with you will be at a, at a disservice if you hadn't done the work on yourself to show up 100% to deliver. And I think that is why we're here on this I, planet. I love that you're on your own personal journey as well because I think that makes it so so much more relatable for people listening to understand that you've recently gone through a transformation and a learning process and it's all very fresh for you. So you're able to, to share that. And that's one of the biggest things that you look for when you're, you're looking for a mentor is someone who has recently gone through a similar transformation that you are on your way to. So I, I, I really love the fact that you are open to saying to all of us that you are still on a journey yourself and still learning. But I, I would love to know what you are personally most proud of this year in your own journey? Well, there's been a lot of things happening this year. I, I've been on this journey for self-awareness, self-mastery. I've implemented lots of disciplinary actions within myself that I'm very proud of. I'm someone who actively runs Spartan races now. As you mentioned earlier, is uh, we launched a podcast, Superhumans at Work. I've had a chance to interview amazing individuals, and we've hit the charts. Uh, number one in India on launch, as well as top 15 charts around the world. 
I'm on this journey where I'm writing this book. Uh, I've just been really, really blessed this year, but I know that these fruits that I'm getting to pick on this year has been the, the results of a series of self mastery and work that I've been doing over the last few years to bring these kinds of ideas that I wanted to see in my life by just continuously working on every aspect from finding more spiritual grounding through the works of things like Neil Donald Walsh and really diving into new age uh, concepts. I mean, I studied a course on chakras recently, which I thought was phenomenal. I look at ways that I can work on being healthier from a health and body perspective, understanding my emotions, communicating better. And I think one of the biggest ones is really making sure that I stand up to my own character and really become proud of the, the sculpture of my life that I want to to leave behind and have that legacy be very powerful and be proud of. And I think by doing this self work is really an important step to do so. So very, very happy as we close off 2019 on this interview right now. Oh, I think you you put in a lot of time for self care and it's evident because I think a lot of us work ourselves into the ground and we're, we're going for that project or that business that we're trying to build and we forget to step back and take that time. I'm guilty of it myself. I get so worked up and excited by the projects that I'm working on and then find myself completely in a zone where I'm snapping at people and, and just being short and not centered. And I think self-care, it needs to, it needs to be first. It needs to come mm. first because you'll be coming from a, a place of balance and awareness. Everything else will, will have a flow on effect. And I'll give a weird challenge for people. I think one of the most important decisions I made this year is I spent that 10 day in silence for a Vipassana retreat. Uh, yeah. And I did that during my birthday. And so I would encourage people to consider slowing down self care and see what happens to your life. Once you've taken those 10 days out of your life and come back, I've just seen an acceleration of everything around me, not from working harder, but to surrendering more. And did I think that's a beautiful acceptance to have. Did you find it an interesting or difficult process to be in silence for 10 days? Extremely difficult. Because you're a talker, aren't you? I am. I'm <laughs> yes, glad you well noticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was very difficult but very insightful. And, uh, yes, really brought me uh, some self-awareness that I think, uh, you know, I, this whole idea of self-awareness becomes extremely important because I, I don't know if anybody picked up on something subtle during this interview is the fact that if you start selling from love, if you don't have self-awareness, you could find yourself being blindsided by selling something that might not have had the impact that you wanted initially. And the whole thing was a game of smoke and mirrors. I found myself in a situation like that where I was just blind in the middle. And you hear these stories of people that do these ridiculous things, such as being a part of a cult or something, and they go back and they say, wow, what happened? And I think when you start being a part of any movement, you should always make sure that you trust your intuition, you have self-awareness, you always ask yourself the question, is this still the right impact? You're questioning your leaders and you're always making sure that you're working on that impact and staying, staying aware so that you don't get carried in your own momentum of enthusiasm. So always do those gut checks. And I think one more thing I'd love to leave your audience with here, Maritza, is the fact that, you know, we talked about these five, five loves of selling from the perspective of being a seller, but if you're a buyer, which you happen to be 50% of the time, if you ask that salesperson to tell you why they love the impact of what they do, why they love the product, why they love the client, what do they know about the benefits it brings to you? What process do they get most excited about and ask them all these questions about self love, you'll be able to flush out all of the bad salespeople because they will not be able to give you those answers. Mm, you will repel them. <laughs> I love that. I love it's that. Your, Thank you. Your douchebag bug spray will push them away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Beautiful, amazing tips there today, Jason. Thank you so much. Where can people find you and where can we look out for you? I know you've got your Superhumans at Work podcast, which is a Mind Valley podcast that people can listen to and subscribe to. You've got an upcoming book, which is called Selling with Love. When is that being released? It'll be a year from now. So we just in the beginning process. So in December, 2020, you'll be able to pick up that book, but I'd encourage everybody to reach out to me directly, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, the name's Jason Mark Campbell, Mark with a C, uh, find me, send me a message. Let me know if this uh, content helped you in any way. I'd love to hear feedback. Yes, absolutely. It certainly helped me, Jason, in many, many ways, more than you'll know. So it's a bit, it's, selling is a big block that I've, I'm working on and that I have to become comfortable with. So 
personally, I've learned a lot from you. I'm sure our listeners have definitely learned a lot as well. And I really appreciate your time. Thanks again. I'm Maritza Barone and thank you for listening to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'd love to keep the conversation going. Let us know what you thought of this episode and if something really profound came up for you that you want to share, let's talk about it. You can find me on Instagram at Things You Can't Unhear or on my personal page at Maritza underscore Barone. And if someone you know will benefit from something that was said in this show, make sure you share it with them too. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and keep up to date with what's next. And if you can spare a few seconds, please rate and review the show on iTunes just so other people can find us more easily and quickly. And as always, my friends, be happy, be healthy, be conscious and be kind.